Jon Stewart is very well known. He has a line to pretty much every politician in the country. He could probably get the president in a couple of weeks if he wanted. What do you think made him say, the person who I need to talk to next is a state senator from Oklahoma? Um, they had said that they were looking to do an episode on guns and had seen um, some of the bills that I'd introduced. I don't know um, if they had reached out to other people first or not, but they told me the reason they reached out to me was because they saw some of the legislation that I had proposed. You volunteered yourself to walk into the lion's den. Why did you do that? Because uh, I'm, I'm not afraid of anyone or anything. I know where I stand on my principles and why. Were you worried that you might not come out of this looking so great? Um, I expected to be shown in a, in a less than positive light. I try to take the opportunity to provide people with the truth, show them the truth. People on the left will say that John Stewart eviscerated me. That's what they're saying. People on the right will say he interrupted you every time you tried to answer a question. He was a bully. Do you consider it more of an interview or was it more of a debate? It was more of a conversation. Um, there was a, that moment when, when he got heated, which he actually apologized for afterwards. 80% yeah. of school shooters uh -huh. either came from a broken or fatherless home. Uh -huh. So you would say no guns for fatherless yeah. homes? No, that's not what I would say. If you believe that the fatherlessness crisis is one of the primary drivers of gun violence in this country, what are some of the things that you have been doing to try to curtail that? It's something that I've been involved with, uh, especially with uh, those children that are in the foster care here in Oklahoma in the system, uh, trying to get churches and individual people involved with those children that don't have fathers. Does correlation equal causation? Not every individual that is in a fatherless home is going to get involved in crime, but the statistics show that they are much more likely. When they are younger, they need a mother and they need more nurturing, but when they get older, they need a father. Uh, that influence on learning what is right from wrong, learning morality. Do you think that's the number one driver of gun violence? With most gun deaths, actually, most gun deaths are suicides. Well, when the majority of the deaths are self-inflicted suicide, that's not gun violence, right? But then when he talks about gun violence with children, the thing that he doesn't mention when he says that it's the number one uh, cause of death for children, well, first of all, the number one cause of death for children is abortion. But it's teenagers involved in gang activity most of which come from fatherless homes. Certain of their tools that they're using would be infringements upon the people's right to keep and bear arms, upon their constitutional rights, upon due so process, you're saying upon other things. That registering is an infringement. Yes. Okay. Throughout human history, when you look at every government that has confiscated firearms, the first step towards that was actually creating a gun registry. Are you afraid of government overreach? Are you afraid that someone will come and try to take people's guns? I'm, I'm not afraid of it, but if you study human history, you'll see that the number one killer of uh, people throughout human history has been governments against their own people. It's an inanimate object. The object itself is not what commits the crime. It's the individual that commits the crime. You can look to how we treat cars and the fact that you need a license and you need to make sure it's up to date, make sure you still know how to use the thing before you get it. And in that case, I don't think people are saying that it's the object, I think they're saying that it's the people. Driving itself is not a right that is protected in the Constitution. Um, so the right to keep and bear arms is a right that is enshrined in the Constitution and it's the only one that says, shall not be infringed. People might say, yeah, murder is illegal, mm -hmm. and clearly that's good, but it's good to take actions to make it a little bit harder to commit murder. Absolutely, I agree, and that's why we have tried to take those actions. We had a bill that we just passed uh, last week through the Oklahoma Senate that would allow for more teachers to be able to carry um, on in, at schools. Will a good guy with a gun always stop a bad guy with a gun? Not always, of course, um, but um, it happens more often than people realize. I mean, there's over a million defensive gun uses every year in this country. The large majority of murders were committed by people who knew the victim, the interfamilial conflict. Does that mean that having more guns in the home would prevent more domestic murders? Um, well, uh, it depends. I mean, yeah, some of it, there, there is obviously domestic issues. Some of that, when they talk about uh, the person knew the victim or whatever, sometimes it's gang-related or some of those things. There was an argument against the Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. saying that if we guarantee these specific rights, then anything else is fair game. All rights belong to the people. So yes, people do have the right to vote. However, to be able to vote, you have to be a citizen, you have to have certain parameters, but when it comes to the right to keep and bear arms, it says it's a right of the individual, of the people. Could that be an argument against birthright citizenship? Oh, 
Absolutely. I mean, um, I've, I introduced a bill that would uh, end birthright citizenship here in this country because if you read the 14th Amendment, you'll see that there's different categories of how people are, are treated. Yes, certain people have inherent rights. Every person that is born upon this planet has uh, the inherent right to self-defense. You don't mind infringing free speech to protect children from this amorphous thing that you think of. If there's people on the left that want to make the case that they have the right to uh, <laughs> to do sexually explicit thing in front of minors, um, that's a weird case for them to try to make because no, they don't have that. Will there be people that will still violate uh, or, or misuse the Second Amendment and go and harm someone? Yes. Will there be people that will still violate and misuse the First Amendment and try to claim that they have that and can go do that in front of children? Yes, but that's why we have the law to punish those people. I think that some people might argue that drag queens is, are not an inherently sexual thing. It's just a person in makeup. Again, we're not banning drag queens entirely. It's just the, the aspect of them doing the sexually explicit uh, performances in front of children. I so that's that, the difference. I think they might be worried, though, that all of their actions are being conflated as sexually explicit versus just a few of them. And I think that they might be feeling that, like, it's almost sort of villainizing them. I mean, if, if they believe that that's what it is, but again, we've put in protections there, this, and it specifically says that they can continue to do that in front of adults. Limited government, constitutionality of it, um, that's how I try to make my decisions and, and focus on the legislation that I introduce. But when you introduce legislation to limit government, is that not technically big government as well? <laughs> I know people have, have asked that because I've introduced so many bills, but most of them are with the intent to limit government. And no, because that's the process. Right now, we have these governmental entities, we have these agencies that are doing these things, and the only way we can address it is through legislation. And I do believe as well that you've mentioned at least a couple of times before that you introduce bills sometimes just to spark a conversation. Correct, yes, and sometimes I introduce that to ha start having those conversations so people are aware of what is taking place, and then somebody else will actually get a bill a year or two later that once people have become aware of the situation, then we can get the bill fully passed. Roger Randall is a professor at OU, and before that he was the president of the state senate. He said to me that bills which are introduced for the sole purpose of sparking a conversation or making a point is a waste of the legislature's time. I'd like to give you a chance to respond. Um, the legislature wastes a lot of time, <laughs> but my intent is to actually get the bill all the way through law, knowing that sometimes it will just be a conversation to start with. But I do want to rectify what I think might be a bit of a discrepancy, at least that I've noticed, which is that you do talk a lot about the Constitution, mm -hmm. but you've also introduced a lot of legislation to curb what you feel is federal overreach. Mm -hmm. It seems to me like there's a problem when you say that we need to worry about the federal constitution, but also not allow the federal government to interfere at all in Oklahoma. Well, I mean, if you look at the federal constitution, again, it's a document to limit the power of the government. Do you believe that the constitution is a living document, or do you think that it's static? <laughs> no, I, I do not believe that it is a living document. If you do not believe that the constitution is a living document, do you believe that the Bill of Rights should have been added to it in the first place? Oh. Uh, well, yes, the, the Constitution can always be amended. It has been amended, you know, over 20 times, uh, including the Bill of Rights, uh, so that is a possibility. Um, but um, that's not making it a living document just because it has been amended. I'm curious if doing that interview gave you any sort of new respect for Jon Stewart, because I know that sometimes, even when you don't necessarily agree with the person you're talking to, you get an understanding for how they feel or why they're saying these things or how they go about doing it. Before and afterwards, John was very polite. Um, we had good conversation and everything. Um, I felt like mostly it was a good conversation. I mean, I, I did an hour and a half interview and they chopped it up and cut it down to that eight minutes. Um, there's things, things he and I discussed that we agree upon. He's done a lot for our veterans. I talked to him about what I think is the ultimate solution, salvation through Jesus Christ. So I got the opportunity to, to share the gospel with him. If, if he invited me to come back, I would go back again. With all of this publicity that's being generated uh, around this interview that you've just done, what are you hoping to get out of it? Um, my, my intent, I always try to be willing to have those conversations, even if it's from differing viewpoints. Uh, so I didn't go into this expecting to gain anything out of it. Uh, I went, just went there to try and share the truth.